You know, the announcement this week of the grand jury's decision uh, apparently did not sit too well with people around the world. And uh, we watched some of us on TV as violence erupted in our own uh, state, which made national news as people began to protest and things got out of hand. At least a couple officers were, were shot. And it probably didn't shock some of us that people wouldn't be happy with, with the verdict. I don't think it would have mattered what was said. Uh, but it just seems to me uh, that today one of the th problems is that truth has become irrelevant. That truth doesn't seem to matter to people anymore. Uh, when you have the facts, and, and by the way, it's hard to even get the facts anymore because most of our media uh, only give us what they want to hear. And so even in this story, it was uh, biased media and some of the things that were said were not in the beginning were not true and you know all of us who watched what happened with George, Flo George Floyd well I shouldn't say all of us most of us looked at that and realized there was a problem this guy was murdered but in this case, the Breonna Taylor case, it's, it's not so black and white, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and so as we're faced with looking at and, you know, the whatever you, if you agree with it or not, the, the decision that came out, I think it just seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, that a lot of people don't care what the truth is. It's more about, uh, at least it seems like, about whatever fits your narrative. Whatever fits our, our particular political belief that we're going to go with that and forget the facts. And so I say all that to say this. I believe we're living in a very dark world today. And that darkness is all around us. And we, <laughs> as I mentioned in, in, in my prayer uh, here or Sunday school one, we, I, get, I get confused, but it seems like our world is upside down. And so as we look at this world and how dark it's become, I think the problem is that light you know, we're, darkness is there because there's no light, right? Whenever there's light, the darkness is gone. The darkness expels the light. Uh, I mean, light expels the darkness. So in the Gospel of John, we read in verse 12 of chapter 8, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And what I'm saying today is that the light that God brings to us dispels all the darkness that surrounds us. And that kind of echoes what was said in, in the fourth gospel here that was read this morning. Where he says, what is coming to being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. Let me read that from the, from the King James. He says in verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by Him through Jesus Christ. Nothing came into being without Him. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all the people. And then he says, in him was life, uh, and the life was the light of all men. 
And he says in verse uh, 5, The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Verse 9, That was the true light, which lighteth every person, or every man, that cometh into the world. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Darkness is expelled by light, and this, the Bible says, is the, the true light. Jesus, on more than one occasion in the book of John, claims that I am the light, that He is the light. Now, there's a, another gospel where He says, you're the light. He turns to the disciples and talks about the church and, and says, you're the light. And in that, he's, not, he's really saying that we are a reflection of that light and that we are a thousand points of light and that we are to point others to Him. And a city that's set on a hill, He says, don't hide your light under a bushel. But in John, He never says, you are the light. But He says more than once, I am the light. And it seems to me that the true light... The one light that can change the darkness is Jesus. Amen? I mean, uh, is there anything else in this world that's going to change our world? Is there anything else that really... I mean, is there a politician that's going to do this? No. Is there a political system that's going to do this? Is there any man, woman, boy, or girl that's going to do this other than Jesus Christ? No. You say, well, that's just so simple. It, it, I just can't accept that. Well, you're right. A lot of people don't accept that. The thing about light, we know, we kind of understand that it's there, but we can't really explain it. You can sit in physics class all day long and learn a lot of things about light. But you'll never really be able to explain what it is. We really don't know what it is. I mean, we see what it does. But we really can't explain it in terms of science or physics. It is something that drives out darkness. And it takes away the darkness. But whatever it is, it was important enough that Jesus mentioned it at least twice in the Gospel of John... I am the light. And he says in verse 3, once again, All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. All things came into being through him. Think about that. Everything that exists, exists because of him. And you see that in nature. I mean, you just, it, it's, it's like creation is everywhere. You see it everywhere. And what Jesus has brought into our world, this life, this life-giving force. When you walk through the mountains and you see the great uh, trees clapping their hands or, or a, a chipmunk uh, dotting along the ground, you see the birds flying through the air, you realize that none of those things exist outside of God. Outside of Jesus Christ, none of those things exist. And he says in verse 9, the true light which lightens everyone has come into the world. You see, the idea there is not that the light just shined on the world, but it broke through the darkness. You get a picture here of, of, of a, an extremely dark world, and all of a sudden the light just turned everything completely different and, and, and exposed everything. The light didn't just shine, but it broke through. It came through in such a way that you couldn't miss it. But I want to warn you today that Jesus is the light of the world. 
And I say I warn you today because it's both a positive and a negative, I guess. Because light does something that sometimes we don't like. It exposes things. It exposes things. And you know, I think sometimes I'm misunderstood. I preach so much on grace and I preach so much on love that I think some people believe that, that I think that anything goes, that what we do doesn't matter, our behavior doesn't matter, and that's not what I believe. I believe God's grace is sufficient. And, and maybe I do, uh, you know, maybe when I get to heaven, God's going to say, you know what, you preached too much on love. He might say that to me. But that doesn't mean that I believe that uh, well, our, our character and our actions do not matter. I heard someone on a podcast not long ago, or a book I was reading, talk about how in the early church we had all these creeds and you know we still use creeds we have the apostles creed uh, that we do every Sunday we talked about that in Sunday school this morning and the problem that they had with with the creeds was it only talked about what we believe and doesn't talk about what we're supposed to do that it's all about I believe I believe I believe but not much talk about changing the world and they have a point. But here's what I think. I think that if you get the mind right, and you get the doctrine right, and you get Jesus right, and you get all that right, that everything else will work out. Because once you get it in the head, and it becomes something in the heart, like we talked about this morning, then it does change the world. But if your mindset is all messed up, if your mind is all messed up and you don't have the light shining in your heart, then you're not going to change the world because everything else is going to be off kilter. And so some things don't make sense in a world today. It just doesn't make sense. And, and uh, you know, I try to understand, I try to be uh, tolerant, I try to be all those things, but, but at the same time, I realize that we live in a very dark world. And light sometimes is not welcomed. I used to, when I was a young man, in between jobs, I started selling rainbow vacuum cleaners. I, I, I want to put vacuum cleaners because the other day I was talking to a millennial and I said, I used to sell rainbows. They're like, you sold rainbows? They didn't know I was talking about a vacuum cleaner. It's a rain I didn't actually sell rainbows. I sold rainbow vacuum cleaners. But I wasn't real good at, at it. But anyway, I, it was, uh, I remember one of the things that, that we did was we had this uh, really bright light when we were in their house that we would turn on. And when we turned that light on, you could see dust particles flying everywhere, kind of like when the sun is shining through the window. And we did that to shock them into realizing how much dust, well, we probably know that because we see dust anyway, but, but there's all this dust floating around that we can't see, but the light exposes that dust. That's what the light of God does. You want to know why I think some people don't go to church? I know there's people that say, well, uh, they're too judgmental, and that may be true in some cases. But I think there's some, sometimes people don't go to church is because they know that when they go to church, or at least they feel like, that their life is going to be exposed, that their sins are going to be exposed, that their darkness is going to be uncovered. And they're right. It probably will. And sometimes people think, well, the preacher knows everything I'm, I'm doing, and he's preaching at me. I've even had people get mad and say, you were talking about me, and I didn't have a clue what was going on in their life. But God did. You see, the Holy Spirit is able to penetrate. The Bible says the Word of God is able to get down in between the joints and the marrow in the deepness of the darkness of your soul. And He, God, knows what is going on. And I may not have a clue, and I don't need to know. 
sometimes people don't want to come to the light because they don't want their lives exposed. And I've had people say, well, I just feel like everybody's just thinking, looking at me when I come into church. And I realize that's not the case. I know this church. I know this people. I've pastored here for eight years. And I know that if somebody walked through this door and has been living in sin, that we would want nothing more for them to be here. But I have people tell me, I don't want to go there because I'm afraid they'll judge me. And I say, they're not going to judge you. They love you. They want you to be here. But yet we feel like that sometimes. If we walk into a room and when we're not living right, we think everybody's talking about us. The Holy Spirit is able to do that. God says, I am the light of the world and I shine in the darkness. You ever, uh, if, you know, sometimes uh, some of you guys that fish, you ever look for worms and pick up rocks and you see all these bugs scatter when the light hits them? Well, that's what the Bible says, that, that men love darkness rather than light. And they hated the light. Do you know that there's people that hate Christians today? And I think, you know, they can make up all kinds of excuses why, and sometimes Christians are, are not what they should be. I, I, I get that. But I think more than anything else anymore, is a lot of people hate Christians. The same reason they hated Jesus. Because he exposed their darkness. Now, there's a cure for sin. There's forgiveness for everyone. But Jesus is the light of the world. And that light is shining on this world. And people don't want to come to the light. I would rather, you know... I would rather live the way I'm living and feel comfortable by myself than to go into church and all of a sudden feel my sins are exposed. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there probably. I remember standing in the back of the church, my hands gripping the pew, and the preacher looking out as if he was preaching right at me, and I knew I was the one. And I tried to act like everybody else. And I tried to sing so he wouldn't think I was a sinner. But God found me. He found me in my deepest, darkest moment. And if he hadn't found me, I wouldn't be here to tell you about it today. I'm telling you about a God who loves you. And even though sometimes it may feel like that he's trying to uh, get you, it's really just our own conscience sometimes and it's the Holy Spirit trying to reveal to us our need for Him. We have to understand that. There was a priest one time who took a group of boys who were living in really bad conditions in the inner city. He took them to a beautiful town and, and a beautiful place in New York City and showed them some of the finest things in the city. He took them to an art museum and showed them the beautiful paintings by all the wonderful artists, masters. Then he took them to a symphony and let them hear the beautiful music. And then he took them on a walk through the district where architects had made these beautiful homes. And then he took them on the bus back home. And that night, one of those young boys set fire to the apartment that they were living in, and it burned to the ground. They were able to get the boys and the families out. And the priest was heartbroken. He went to that boy in tears and said, why? Why did you do it? And the little boy said, you know, I saw all those beautiful things and how beautiful it was. And then I came home. And I saw all the ugly. And I just wanted to burn it. Sometimes the light that God shines reveals the contrast between what we're living now and what could be. And it can be upsetting. There used to be something we called conviction where it was old time, Holy Ghost, heartfelt conviction where God came down and we prayed for conviction to fall on people. 
Not so much anymore. Conviction is old-fashioned anymore, isn't it? But oh, that we could be convicted once again. Oh, that we could run to the cross once again and say, God, forgive me for what I said or what I did. We live in a world today where people don't ever want to admit their, their faults or their mistakes. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, my daddy didn't treat me right. My mommy didn't treat me right. Or I went through a divorce or whatever. And we blame everything on everybody. We ought to be like that fellow said, it's me, it's me, Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. If the light shines on you today, don't run from it. Run to it. Run to it. That close with this, the, the song that we sung today. Let me see if I can find that. The, uh, the light of the world is Jesus. This song, 1875. And we're kind of looking at the different songs and hymns the last couple of weeks, and, and we're letting that kind of guide us. Um, we're not really following the lectionary. But on the last Thursday of 1876, Philip Bliss prayed with his boys, Paul, who was two, and George, who was four, and explained that he and Lucy were leaving by train for Chicago to sing at D.L. Moody's Tabernacle at year's end. And he said, I would rather that God would allow me to be here with you, but I must be about the God's will. And so the boys were left in care of the relatives. And the story goes like this. It was another passenger on the Chicago-bound train. Mr. J.E. Uh, Buchel later told this story. He said there were 11 cars on the train that left Buffalo at 2 o'clock Friday afternoon in a blinding snowstorm. We neared the bridge over the river in Ohio in about 7.45. We ran on the structure of a rate of about 10 miles an hour, and the whole train was on the bridge when it gave way. The bridge is about 200 feet long, and only the first engine had passed over the, when the crash came. The first thing I heard was a cracking in the front part of the car, and then the same cracking in the rear. <laughs> Then a sickening, a sickening oscillation and sudden sinking, and I was thrown, stunned from, the, uh, from my seat. The ironwork bent and twisted the, like snakes, and everything took horrid shapes, and I heard a lady scream in anguish, and then I heard the cry of fire. The crackling of the flames, the whistling wind, the screaming, the hurt, made a pandemonium of that little valley and the water of the freezing creek was red with blood or black with the flying cinders. The fire stole swiftly along the wreck and in a few moments the cars were all in flames and the sight was sickening. The whole wreck was in on fire and from out the frozen valley came great bursts of flame. And according to him, Philip Bliss, who wrote this song, The Light of the World is Jesus, initially survived the wreck, but he crawled back through a window to save his wife, and both perished together. And among Philip's last hymns was this song, The Light of the World is Jesus. And the final verse says this, No need of the sunlight in heaven were told, the light of the world is Jesus, the Lamb of the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. We're going to a place where Jesus' light will outshine even the sun. It's the light that exposes, that reveals but it's also the light that forgives and loves. And I want to invite you today to come to that light. As the musicians come today, the invitation is open for you. I still believe that God is in the saving business. I still believe that the same way 
our forefathers and people got saved is the same way we get saved today. It's just by coming to the light and coming to the cross and saying, Jesus, I accept your gift. The Bible says that whoever who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have that promise that God won't turn you away. Would you do that today as we sing? Hear the benediction. Go out among the outcasts and the grieving and speak the word of life and hope. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.